This is Collapsing the Virtualized Storage Stack, how root on vertfs can eliminate stacked block devices in virtual environments. My thanks in advance to the BSD CAN organizers and participants, and all of the images I have used are Creative Commons or my own. I will present a crash course in block storage, why we're done layering storage, the good, the bad, and the ugly of QCOW, VHDX, VMFS, and friends, a hypervisor status report, and hands-on vertfs. Let's begin with a story. Once upon a time, someone, somewhere, suggested that personal computers would be good for storing recipes. And on that same day, for the purpose of this narrative, the same person declared that computer storage must be comprised of a series of logically addressed layers, each only familiar with the layers immediately above and below it. So what do I mean by logically addressed? You have probably heard of logical block addressing, and it's actually quite simple. Every block storage device is a lot like a tape measure with 512 byte or 4 kilobyte blocks as the units, rather than inches or centimeters. To address a given offset, you simply skip to it. And yes, some disks have 520 byte blocks to support encryption and other things that are not visible to the user. The addressing starts at zero, and in the tape measure example, you skip four inches to address the fifth inch. The dd command works this way with the skip property, and note that dd does not know or care if the underlying block storage device is a spinning disk, a SATA SSD, an NVMe device, a file, a partition, or a memory-backed disk. I'm sure there are more examples, and that list is very revealing. All block storage devices are imaginary. A spinning hard disk drive uses a miraculous collection of physical, electrical, and aeronautic engineering feats to deliver a consistent illusion of a long sequence of blocks, when in fact there are platters, cylinders, and tracks hiding inside. In layered storage, only the lowest level physical disks are of a fixed size. Everything above them is configurable within the confines of the devices below them. In this simple example, four one terabyte disks could be combined by a RAID controller to provide three terabytes of user accessible storage and the ability for one disk to fail without compromising the integrity of the three terabyte imaginary block device. The three terabytes can in turn be partitioned in a number of ways with additional layers such as encryption. The perceived simplicity and consistency of this approach is attractive. A file system does not need to know that it is on a RAID controller or has an encryption layer in between, as long as every layer follows the rules and you don't violate the layers. You just keep layering. What's not to like? Well, a few things. To begin with, the operating system in control of the file system atop a hardware RAID controller may have zero insights into the health of the participating disks. One out of four could have died, and the system may never know it. There is no guarantee of software utilities being available to assist. In the case of a disk failing, the smart health information available on each disk should provide an early warning of trouble and in this simple example with four disks in a RAID 5 configuration, the prompt replacement of a disk is critical because the loss of a second disk will compromise the array. Unfortunately, many hardware RAID controllers hide smart data, and the utilities to access that information are inconsistent, to put it politely. Furthermore, a hardware RAID controller may provide the illusion of a high-performance storage system, when in fact it only provides a high-performance write cache. In the spirit of hiding the health of drives, the controller may also hide the health of the battery that backs up that write cache, resulting in surprise data loss in case of sudden system panic or power loss. Does a failing battery beep in the night? From there, hardware RAID controllers are also very particular about card model, firmware, and on-disk formatting that can offer a false sense of security of having a meaningful spare controller card. Can you still purchase the exact model with the exact firmware that failed, so you can access your data? Does exact in fact mean exact? Now of course, hardware RAID controllers work well for many administrators, 
and while OpenZFS users prefer avoid them, they're ironically not what puts the nail in the coffin of layered storage. We have large disks to thank for that. I would argue that the arrival of the one terabyte drive signaled the beginning of the end of layered block storage. The benefits of blissfully layering block storage devices begin to break down as those devices grow in size, and the actual data on each layer becomes disproportionate in size. If a hardware RAID controller providing a virtual block device does not have any insights into the contents of the block device, it has no choice but to perform any rebuild operations blindly in a linear manner. Have 300 gigabytes on a 3 terabyte array comprised of four disks? The underlying controller has no choice but to assume the block device is full and must dutifully replace a terabyte of blocks. That is time consuming and 20 terabyte disks are headed our way. The solution? Violate the layers. Solutions include object storage, erasure coding, and distributed file systems. But these solutions are no more consistent or available as smart utilities for RAID controller cards. Can your Mac participate in that Ceph cluster? Fortunately, OpenZFS addresses these issues well, and it provides exemplary data integrity, snapshotting, compression, thin provisioning, and overall flexibility. But, the topic of the hour is virtual environments, that is, the storage for a hypervisor providing virtualization facilities. Some of the innovations to date have included enhanced disk images like QCOW and VHD, plus VMware VMFS. For the most part, virtualization solutions have introduced smarter disk images that feature sparse allocations, meaning only the data that is actually written to the image is stored, or have copy and write facilities to allow for snapshotting. Fortunately, these features are all provided by OpenZFS, which raises the question of VMFS, the Virtual Machine File System. VMFS is a clustered file system that allows multiple VMware servers to pass control of data stores between one another. It is proprietary, and the third party utilities to mount it do not support the latest version. So you may be tempted to ask, are VMFS and OpenZFS a match made in heaven? In a word, no. Story time. <clears throat> Once upon a time, I was asked to assist with a zpool suffering from metadata corruption that contained an 18 terabyte VMFS formatted zvol. While I do not recommend putting that many eggs in one basket, nothing will prevent you from doing it. Harking back to the hardware RAID card example, there were naturally only a few gigabytes of VMDK images in the VMFS data store that were urgently needed. Easy! Import the pool read only, copy out the VMDKs, and rebuild with a better distribution of the available storage. But no, VMFS is the only file system that, to the best of my knowledge, can only be mounted read-write. VMware Engineering confirmed this, and I would argue that this fact violates the laws of file systems. DDing off 18 terabytes to another data store to obtain a few critical gigabytes was not practical, and the data was restored from other sources. To add insult to injury, it would appear that NFS supports all vSphere high availability and fault tolerance features. Plus, you can mount NFS read only in VMware. So, OpenZFS datasets and zvols will do, thank you very much. But a fundamental tenet of modern virtualization is support for foreign operating systems and thus foreign file systems. To put ext4 on a zvol will provide checksummed blocks, but no additional checksumming of the blocks containing the saved files on those blocks. You can store corrupt files on OpenZFS, and OpenZFS will perfectly preserve their corruption. There's also the issue of write amplification. When the block size of a guest file system is transposed on the given vol block size of a zvol, your mileage may vary, to put it politely. OpenZFS compression will mitigate the issue to some extent, but the block sizes will always compete. So what to do? 
I gave a preview in my 2018 paper, Institutionalizing FreeBSD Isolated and Virtualized Hosts Using BSD Install, ZFS, and NFSD, in which I described a method of exporting an open ZFS boot environment over NFS on one system and booting a second physical or virtual system from it using PXE. What are some other advantages of booting a physical or virtual machine from a data set? You could VM boot a new boot environment before you hardware boot to it. You could boot your backups. And you could VM boot your file-based jails and zones. So let's set our eyes on the prize. OpenZFS is as good as it gets, and I've personally reconfirmed that a dozen times. You could lose half of its features, and it would probably still be the best option available. I consider OpenZFS a human right, and you are welcome to watch my 2019 VBSDCon and OpenZFS Developer Summit talks in which I share my findings using OpenZFS on Illumos, FreeBSD, NetBSD, macOS, GNU Linux, Solaris, and Windows. OpenZFS is the most ported file system after, what, FAT32? So then come the hypervisors. Each one of those operating systems, with the exception of Solaris, now features one or more hypervisors. That said, this is the OpenZFS hypervisor nexus. In my opinion, the fundamental hypervisor features are nesting, support for ZFS on the host, support for root on ZFS on the host, support for vertfs, and guest support for root on vertfs. I mention nesting because while it is not particularly useful in production, it is very useful for development and testing. Beehive was partly developed on VMware Fusion, and Linux KVM is proving useful for current Beehive development and testing. I do not, however, consider nesting a must-have feature given the complexity it brings and the difficulty implementing it. It would appear that Zen and Hyper-V only provide support for nesting themselves, which is not an unreasonable limitation if the implementation is significantly simpler. From there, OpenZFS is a critical feature, and currently Illumos, FreeBSD, Ubuntu, and Proxmox all support root on ZFS. Next comes VertFS, which is the subject of this talk, and ultimately root on VertFS, which is currently only available in GNU Linux using Grub. If we're going to hypercollide, let's do it in style. The Plan 9 from User Space Operating System aimed to be equidistant and included a network-centric file system with this goal in mind. The alternative to this day is the network file system, or NFS, which some people consider not a file system because of its limitations with various access types. Hands-on 9P VertFS Perhaps the most surprising place you will find 9P VertFS is in the latest Windows subsystem for Linux, Weasel 2. It is also easily accessed in Linux KVM and is arriving in FreeBSD Beehive. The Windows subsystem for Linux version 2 requires the 2004 build of Windows 10 or later, and you can simply shop for a Linux distribution. Once installed, you can see that there are two 9P mounts by default one for slash init, and one for the Windows C drive. Linux appears to boot from a 1 gigabyte VHDX image named ext4.vhdx, but I could not boot this image under Beehive or KVM. Note that Hyper-V does not appear to include 9P support at this time, despite Weasel 2 being based on Hyper-V rather than Linux emulation. Moving on to Linux QEMU KVM, Ubuntu and Zubuntu have everything we need out of the box plus the option of root on ZFS. A vertfs share is called a file system share, and it is simply another piece of hardware to add to the VM. I am simply sharing my home directory. From inside the VM, the vertfs share is mounted with mount type 9P, plus a few flags. For a synchronous write smoke test, I used FIO with 512-byte blocks 
and a 10 megabyte file. The 9P mount file run was 13 seconds faster than the VertIO mount. I'll take it. Finally, 9P VertFS in FreeBSD and Beehive. Support for VertFS in Beehive has been three years in the making, and Juniper Networks is developing VertFS client support. For testing, I built a release from the development branch and manually added a VertFS mount to a local copy of VM Run SH. From there, I added the Beehive UEFI firmware development package and installed Ubuntu from ISO and booted it from a 20 GB disk image. Next, I followed the exact same mount procedures in the Ubuntu VM as I did under KVM, with the addition of comparing it to an NFS share. And the exact same smoke test with the addition of NFS. Do you recall the results under KVM? They were over two and a half minutes long for the same test. On FreeBSD, under 10 seconds in all cases with VertFS coming first, followed by NFS, followed by the local file system. Now, mind you, the hardware was very different. The KVM machine is a dual Xeon E5 server with 64 gigabytes of RAM, while the FreeBSD machine is an i5 based ThinkPad X230 with 8 gigabytes of RAM. However, the FreeBSD machine has an older Intel SSD while the server has a random laptop drive. Because we're talking about 10 megabytes of data, I suspect this difference is architectural and not attributed strictly to the hard disk versus SSD. So where do we stand? The FreeBSD Beehive VertFS code should arrive in current any day now, with more improvements to come. GNU Linux supports root on VertFS here and now, and the Juniper code is still under development but warrants early testing. But, testing FreeBSD current can be a bit inconvenient. The idea of frequent, if not continuous, build worlds brings flashbacks to the early 2000s when that was common. So, one more thing. Fellow BSD CAN speaker Connor Bay and I have produced up.bsd.lv a source of binary upgrades for FreeBSD Current. You will need to download one of our installer images to jump on this train, but from there it is over 99.9% .9 off-the-shelf FreeBSD. Each update is an upgrade due to the nature of FreeBSD update patch levels, but we are investigating how to provide actual patch levels. I welcome you to give it a try and hopefully FreeBSD will provide this service in the future. Thank you for watching, and you are welcome to reach out to me with questions. Okay. Cool. We have Michael Dexter here for his Q&A session. So, Michael, it's over to you, and when you're done, I'll turn everything back off. Thank you. Go ahead. Cool. Thank you. Hello again, and there will be some lag, so this will be a little interesting. Laptops everywhere. Okay, so there was a question about Windows support and if the Red Hat ISO with Vert IO drivers has Vert FS support, that would be great, but uh, that remains to be seen. So go ahead and post your questions to IRC. I will read them out and do my best to get this all in sync. Thank you, Dan. So it sounds like, yes, Windows does have some amount of VertFS support in the Red Hat. The um, Vert, uh, Vert IO drivers, great. That's good to hear. So, questions? Anyone? It would be great to be able to talk to you live. <laughs> and then to go to the Royal Oak and have had coffee at Mr. Horton's down the street.
I see the, oh, right, file permissions and X attributes, perhaps from Mr. Thompson. Uh, so uh, you can see the work taking place at uh, bsdfund.org. And let me just bring that up for my own refresher on phase two. So the second phase of the work is to look at uh, the X adder com compliance to make sure that's all in good order. And I believe ACLs are in reasonable a good form, but any file system test suites like the PJD test suite should definitely be aimed at it to make sure that those are all uh, correct. <clears throat> um, let's see, question, can you recap what's needed to have a VertFS rooted VM on a 9P VertFS host? Uh, there are some examples out there on how in Grub you pass in the essential 9P parameters. Um, if I can, I'll, I'll try to find that. Uh, 9P vert. It was one example in a template from the, what was it? One of the like Vagrant or something. Pa, 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 pa. I'll need to dig that up. It, I, I didn't get that working. And it came up yesterday on the Beehive call to look at getting FreeBSD to boot, root on VertFS. And fortunately, that's on Juniper's radar, and hopefully we'll see that, which is exciting. Okay, can VertFS be mounted on Windows VMs if you need to run them? I'm guessing that your Windows VM with root on VertFS is out of the question, of course. So a few things there. One, according to others in the IRC, and yes, there's probably long lag. Uh, it sounds like maybe the Red Hat provided Vert IO drivers for Windows on an ISO might have VertFS support. I will definitely look into that. That's great. Now, that's a perfect question for WSL Conf that was canceled just as the pandemic hit. And I was hoping to head up to Seattle and attend that in person and learn more. But fortunately, with that much attention to VertFS within Microsoft in what's considered, I guess, a tier one project, the uh, uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, then maybe they will bring that in more broadly on Hyper-V. I certainly hope they will, but I did make a point of trying under Hyper-V to look for it as a, a providable device, and I sure didn't find it. I hope that answers your question. Did everything just stop? I hope the video didn't just stop. Everything's working here according to someone I believe in Europe. Um, given that Grub can boot pre-BSD, uh, I genuinely have no idea if you could actually use that to pass a vertfs file system into it, but it's worth uh, vertfs.ini. Cool, thank you for mentioning the driver. I will take some notes here as per tradition. Question for the group, has anyone used VertFS in any way, shape, or form to date? Perhaps even in Windows. Uh, VertFS.ini, uh, Red Hat, ISO, and Grub Food. and violate the layering model. Yes, indeed. So good, the stream is good in Europe. That's good to hear. And for the person who asked very early on about a pop filter, I have my trusty Zoom H1 with the wind filter with a pop filter, like eight bucks off uh, an online store, slammed on top of it. And hopefully I didn't pop too bad. Um, Adam has not used that. And for those who followed on Twitter about my uh, journey on headsets, I went with the Bayer Dynamics with uh, Decani ear pads. And so far, so good. It's comfortable, big enough for me, et cetera, not to be too off topic, but that came up. Nope, haven't used it. 
Does anyone in the IRC have horror stories about stacking file systems, be it write amplification, be it data corruption, be it otherwise? Because I'm, I've certainly seen that in my work, but uh, I'm sure there are some cases I have absolutely not thought of, and I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Try to bring these together. <laughs> thinking from the talk what else I wanted to go off on. So one, I definitely missed uh, net BSD in my hypervisor matrix. I went with the ones I've tried to various degrees, but it's been many years since I ran net BSD Zen, although it treated me extremely well back in the day. Um, what else? Ooh, not a file system. I did, I'll just share this. Uh, I, was trying pixie booting for a different talk and I tried Zen pixie booting. And I welcome you take, to take a look at varlib Zen store D TDB, which they refer to either as a tree database or a trivial database. Now that database, which is slightly more than a glorified lock file and could probably be a text file, was not happy on NFS. It just refused to work and I believe there are some uh, either password databases or other simple databases, databases, air quotes here, in even FreeBSD that are not happy on NFS. So there is a, a rather sophisticated structure in FreeBSD to have like MFS images come up and give you a proper, properly accessible file system. So I did propose a GSOC project to do an a NF, root on NFS audit of the operating system, but that no one, there were no takers, but it is a long-term question of what are all those crazy edge cases? And I've also seen that various folks want to say, put um, uh, what is it, QuickBooks on a system and have the master one where the main bookkeeper has QuickBooks there and others connect and open the file. It is very unhappy on say Samba. Uh, there are just simple little database issues that have whatever seek or you name it that aren't compatible. So those are, those are two things I've seen in the field. Okay, back to questions. Oh, I've had some nasty bugs with QCOW2 images formatted ButterFS. Alrighty then. FreeBSD update work, I'm welcome to talk about that. I would, I am more than happy to in the remaining 10 minutes, but let's see, we've had Razor Raid right over iSCSI on a SAN. Retries and timeouts burned us, it sounds like. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, so of those, please do scream out the questions, but there's some, a question about the FreeBSD update work. Uh, yeah, so as I touch on the talk, you can visit up.bsdlv. That was my epic procrastination with a colleague, Connor Bay, who will speak in a few hours. And I've been waiting for the the VertFS bits to hit uh, head. And so in that process, in preparation to make it more efficient to test it, he and I, with the help of Colin and others, uh, made sense of FreeBSD update. And it was quite enlightening. And wow, it's uh, it's a very old piece of software. It was originally, it's the framework from PortSnap from quite some time ago. And uh, so what this allows you to do, and that is, I'll put in chat here, up dot .bsd.l. Oh, thank you for Luna for posting that. Uh, so these are releases. Um, the infrastructure is designed for, say, you know, you do your standard update doing patch levels. Well, those are all based on security advisory. So we're looking at if we can sort of have a, have a fake meta advisory that could be an incremental update for like the two weeks of changes between any given official snapshots. So uh, we are doing full builds and you can do an upgrade with a dash R release between the builds. However, it does have the uh, builds that have smaller diffs. It's a special feature in there that's completely behind the scenes, but it's a smaller diff between them. So it's actually pretty efficient and uh, ba, ba, ba. 
that is as close as we can get to the patch levels. And I've, it's, let's see, it's 99% off the shelf. It is, or more, it's, it's all standard FreeBSD. If you find a bug in there or a kernel mismatch with a package or any of that, that will happen on head anyway. Um, the one thing we did change is not have FreeBSD update hit the pager and have you just kind of step through it because there's nothing interactive there and you can capture it to a script or whatever. So that's one little niggler that's been bothering me and I turned that off. But other than that, it is pretty straightforward. Let's see. No, just binary. Dis da, 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 da. Looking at the questions here. Oh, come on, more questions, please. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, there are not uh, previous updates for ARM64. So that's something we're looking at. And we do have a humble uh, soft iron machine, the Overdrive 1000 that builds world in like five hours instead of like 30 minutes on my dual Xeon. Um, that is of interest and on the radar. There was some inquiry on Twitter about, say, IPv4 and IPv6 only releases. I'm mildly curious if there is demand for that. I do see a question. Kind of off topic, but I would appreciate if you could talk a bit about ZFS and direct IO if you're familiar with it, or even open channel SSDs. No, I have not delved into that. Uh, my interest has just been this slow migration to NVMe. And I very much like the notion of U.2 NVMe drives because they are more user friendly instead of like a card that takes a client with a screwdriver to like install. They look like a big full height two and a half inch drive. I've been using those uh, using on my limited budget some $150, 400 gig Intel P3700s, I think they are off eBay that are new for like 150 and using a, a PCI adapter. And fortunately those adapters are affordable because it's, it's just PCI to PCI. So it just kind of routes everything. Um, ba, 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 ba. Okay. So no, I, I will make a note to look into ZFS plus direct IO. Oh, and open channel SSEs. Uh, you're welcome to post a link to either of those for the group, and I am interested. But again, being living in like the era of Ivory Bridge hardware, which won't boot to NVMe, I have one quick note on that. Uh, open channel. I just learned this week that the Samsung 950 Pro NVMe U2 device apparently has boot BIOS, so you can boot it on an older machine. All my old Ivy Bridge machines won't boot to NVMe, but that might, which is kind of cool. But wow, those are expensive. Somehow the 950 is like an old sports car that people love. Okay, about the 9PFS work, are there plans to keep up with new 9PFS things? I'm totally failing to think about it, right? Yeah, there's the dot .L and the dot .other versions of it. And yes, yeah, so this was all supposed to be rocking along, but uh, the code that was 90 something percent ready January 5th or so, uh, has been subject to a great amount of scrutiny in things like make files and the location of the library and is it you know handled as a vendor branch and so that's been worked out and it should be in there um, any day now which I've been saying for weeks but uh, very much I'd like to see this be a, a ongoing multi-month if not multi-year effort and thank you very much to everyone who's helped support that work the it's just it's ready to go, but it's it's just not there yet. Um, in general, all this stuff is about getting legacy bits out of the storage stack out of the way. Yes, that would be great. I'm taking a look at this link. Someone's posted GitHub. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, the performance was one of the best surprises. And key point, my dual Xeon, it's essentially a Dell 720 from Compellent. Uh, crawling compared to a, a pretty humble little i5 x230 laptop. Yes, the laptop had an old SSD, but that was night and day performance differences with 
FreeBSD doing very, very well. So that's the next phase is to really pound on performance, pound on file system compliance, thanks to like PJD test suite. Thank you, Pavel, for that. Um, we've got like four minutes to go and I see another link there. So please, more questions. And you know where to find me. I'm Michael Dexter on Twitter. Uh, I'm on various Slack channels, but I try to be working out in the open. Um, Pound Beehive on Freenode, I believe it's Freenode, is also a very good place. I'm not on there 24 seven and I'm not with using Quasa like the cool kids. So let's see which server that's on. I should know this. It's either Geek Shed or it is, no, it's not telling me. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, where to find me. I know, hello, double, yeah, yeah, I do miss the hallway session, the Royal Oak session, you name it. As for the group two, if I can distract, anyone else using NetBSD, NetBSD ZFS stories, or sorry, ZFS stories? Um, I do have a machine spun up and I did treat it equally for my uh, OpenBSD Developer Summit talk comparing you know, like 10 different platforms uh, that, that can be found online. Uh, it does need a little more attention from my part, but performance was pretty good right out of the box. And that was just about when nine landed. Yeah, I, it was either weeks before, or weeks after. And so that's uh, definitely something to look into. And for all of those other platforms, be it, well, any of Jorgen's work with Windows and Mac OS, once everyone's on OpenZFS 2.0 single common upstream, that will get very exciting. So it'll probably take minimum six months for six months to a year for NetBSD and others to get synchronized on the same OpenZFS 2.0. But yes, free note. Thank you very much. I'm yeah, it's still a bit early out west here. So uh, Beehive Futures, that's a valid question. Uh, this one's exciting. The Save Restore has apparently landed in head. I have not given it a try. Uh, there was a massive improvement to Windows performance as a guest recently. That was very important to people. Um, I would love to follow up with the person who posted VGA BIOS on the developers list, on the virtualization list. I will, I've been meaning to ah, look at that. And as part of FreeBSD update, I have a script to build kind of all the things and apply patches such that I, for my own purposes and the purpose of the talk you see here, uh, I've been building like the conclusive VertFS build and the Juniper builds, and I can post installer ISOs of these development branches where it's like one feature, but at least it's a VM or ISO that you can try that feature with. Okay, we are, I don't know if I get cut off firmly at uh, on the hour, but, we're about a minute away. Thank you so much for attending. I will continue as long as this stays up. Oh, good. Some more links about open channel SSDs. Excellent. Yeah, that's new to me. I'm I I do live a bit in the past on my hardware because that's what my budget can afford. But uh, yeah, it's great to see familiar names there. I wish we were headed off to lunch right now and we can sit down and discuss this further. But again, you know where to find me. Uh, I'm pretty noisy on Twitter, but also pound beehive on Freenode. And yeah, curtain time. Thank you. I appreciate this and I'll see you somewhere. No SQL folks are going nuts over the open channel stuff. I will definitely take a look. And I've asked Dan if I should just sort of exit. <laughs> Finished? Yep, okay. I think so. We'll stop the stream.